Just picked over the first year. Uh, Anna Blylow, our city councilor, Ward 18, uh, to her left, next in, uh, next to be elected, Andrew Cash in Davenport, uh, elected in May. Uh, we're happy to have him, and I'm glad you could make it tonight. Uh, and our, our precious recruit, elected uh, official, uh, Jonah Shine, was just almost exactly a month ago. Over six. Still has that fresh car smell. <laughs> <laughs> a fresh, a fresh uh, blackberry smell. Um, so I thought uh, it would be interesting because I have uh, experienced a lot of confusion between the three levels of government, what they deal with, where they overlap, where they don't, where the boundaries are on certain issues. So I thought it would be great to have our three new um, elected officials here in one place. Uh, we get to meet them and also discuss uh, this confusion hopefully give, uh, define some of those boundaries for us and also maybe identify where there's overlap and room for improvement uh, for uh, Davenport. Um, so uh, the list I made was kind of arbitrary, but I began with health care only because it is my um, understanding that health care is the largest envelope of money in this country for any one thing. Uh, I could be wrong, but that's my understanding. Healthcare is number one, which is where most of our tax dollars go. So that's why I put it there. Um, but there's education, environment, public transit. Maybe you should go to second today, considering the accident down here. You can remember that for us. Maybe it's more urgent. Um, <laughs> Childcare and housing. Um, and I've allotted 10 minutes to each. It's flexible, but I don't want to keep anybody too, too long. We generally like to wrap around being 30. So, um, Maybe I'll just I'll hand it over to you three, and we can discuss uh, healthcare. Okay. Well, would it be okay if I just ask for an introduction about healthcare? Just met people. Okay. I mean, all my yeah. groups. Is that okay? Just that I we hear people's names. Is that okay? So just have and just met them here. Uh, Henry Freshman. I'm involved with some of the websites in the neighborhood. Dr. Park. Dr. Ph. So we have got a new one coming. Public rules. Dr. Ph. What was the second one? City rinks. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah. We've got this new one, public public rules. Here, which is public rules. Yeah, public rules, which is supposed to be a collection <laughs> of reference material on rules that people encounter when they try to do stuff and what happens when they encounter oh, these great. rules. It's, it's, it's quite 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 ambitious. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, so, yeah. So. Okay. I know. Yeah. So. I live in the neighborhood. Oh yeah. I've lived in the same house for 30, more than 30 years. Um, and I am the moderator of the Duck and Grove Lister. And I'm a local artist writer. Your name. Oh, and my name. Thanks. <laughs> and I rely on Henrik for everything. <laughs> and my name's Rebella Gammon. Uh, I'm Jonathan Spencer. I'm just a local homeowner. I come by and check out the meeting. I'm Vic Edris, and um, I've been a Diggin member for a few years. I live down on Symington Avenue, and I also do the JunctionTriangle.ca website. Uh, I'm Richard Monjet. I'm a resident here for the past 10 years and a Diggin member, and I'd like to do all sorts of things in the neighborhood with all sorts of groups. Uh, my name is uh, Fred Mattel. I actually live just outside of Ward uh, 18 across the border into uh, 14. And uh, I've been a member of the game for a little while, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Uh, a <coughs> and I'm Ken Wood, and I'm an activist uh, in the Service. And I ran against the uh, Anna Silver City Council, and uh, I'm just say publicly now, I my goals for her now. I'm at College of Lansdowne, and uh, I got a lot of concerns for uh, my name is Carmen Martino, and I'm from uh, Toronto Public Library, first piece on French. And uh, I represent all my patrons that walk into our doors every day and uh, keep them up to date on what's going on. Library, library. Uh, my name is Ed, and I've been in the neighborhood for 
12 years, and I'm renovating expenses, my discussion this evening, so I'm here to stay. Can't afford to move now. And uh, I'm also uh, registered with wife. So I would like to know.
all manner of, of urban infrastructure um, planning. I mean, of course, you're not going to get into the micro level of it, but we need, I think, uh, a certain level of, of strategy on the national level when it comes to transportation and transit, public transit, when it comes to affordable housing we can get to. So I guess the short answer is it's not so simple. Uh, certainly when someone comes into my office with a, uh, with a, a, with a parking issue, you know, uh, that isn't something that I can, you know, uh, deal with, or that's not my domain. I'll do the best that I can, but that's not my, you know, that's not my jurisdiction. So there's specific things, like if someone comes in about uh, a Canada Pension Plan issue, or an immigration issue, or an employment insurance issue, then we have, you know, we're very much uh, uh, able to help them out, uh, or at least give them the right information. Oh, the SP, they're going to go to Jonah. So, anyway, that's. Uh, What's all the other thing? I'm curious. It's like a, a disability pension that's a. Yeah, that's a problem. It's the ritual. Right. So, there's not a lot of. Somebody had an issue with care for their parent, aging parent, or their child. There's not a lot you can do. So, like my understanding is that I'd just like to get some. So the federal government has envelopes of money they give to the provinces. You know, uh, here in Ontario, you have X million or billion for your health care for the next two years. Mm -hmm. You can do what you want with it as long as you follow these federal guidelines. Does it work somewhat like that? Uh, Otherwise, they don't get too involved. Yeah, well, well, you know, I mean, you mentioned that elder care. And death. I mean, that's a huge issue that, that we're trying to... Uh, advocate around at the federal level. There was an election issue in our party had a like, very good, strong policy federal on that. Uh, but again, that's that is like the delivery of that is provincial. Right. Um, but you know what we're what our plan is uh, um, once Jonah gets his office set up is that essentially we're going to be able to intake anyone that comes into our office who has a provincial issue because we're not going to say oh go to this no you're in the wrong office we'll be able to actually you know if, some, if it is a provincial issue we'll be able to do the proper intake and and then the follow-up is going to happen um, with Jonah's staff and vice versa uh, we, we, we seem to be at the federal level talking to the money a lot and you talked about yeah. the, the push to Situation towards crisis is lobbying a big factor. Is the, uh, the private sector lo lobbying in particular a big factor in that in Ottawa? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Short. There's a lot of that going on. <laughs> Andrew, a lot of people talk about prevention and healthcare being a way to, uh, you know, save money. But you know, I, I, I was just. I'm a picture in my sketchbook this week, and um, and uh, it, it's just it's how to save the system. Here's one page. Um, it's how to save this. I'll, I'll explain it to you guys. But it's how to save the system a million dollars. Like if I want to go to if I want to find out if I have enough iron in my blood, I have to go. I have to make an appointment with my doctor. I get a 10 o'clock appointment with my doctor. She'll see me at 12. And uh, then she'll send me to uh, get a blood test. I'll go get the blood test. And then uh, if I want the blood test results, I have to make another appointment with my doctor to get the blood tests. And OHIP is paying for all these different uh, services. And I think if we had access to our own records, if they made them available to us, and they were talking about you know, the, the concept of uh, Privacy and security issues. And it's like, yo, if I have, if I can do an ATM thing on online, um, you can flip through it if you like it, or whatever. But, uh, but uh, yeah, not right the second. But did you want to say that? Yeah. But um, the point, uh, the point I'm making is that if we just, you know, if, if doctors get used to having an endless refillable pocket, to you know, like. They can have their hands in my pocket, and, and uh, why can't we just phone a doctor's office and say, "What's the iron 
level and uh, go from there, you know? Like, can we change policy? And if we wanted to change policy, um, how, would, how would that happen? Like, like who is the person, and like, who's in charge? Of, and like, we're paying the doctors to keep, uh, keep us away from our own health records. And it would make a whole lot of, it would make a whole lot of sense because it would free up the doctors to see other patients who, you know, we don't have enough doctors to see all the real issues. So, uh, how would we go about changing a policy like that? Like, I know, I'll call my doctor's office and they'll tell me your level is X and then that saves uh, OHIP having to pay the doctor for me to see the doctor for another visit and it's more convenient for me. So, I mean, healthcare, the way it's administered uh, is mostly provincial and uh, you know, the health minister, I believe, is still Deb Matthews eventually, and she's the person who's going to lead that charge, uh, and she's going to need the support uh, of all the So, members. writing a letter to her would be a place to start? Yeah, uh, I mean, that's, that's a place to start, and I, mean, I think, like... Like, I don't know who's, you know, I, you guys all deal with health care, and I don't know, for example, who, you know, who, uh, like, I, I, it's really hard to figure out the delineation, so I'm really thrilled to hear about this meeting. It sounds like, in this case, but the province seems to be where most yeah. of the Healthcare money the things yeah. would uh, happen, okay. you know. Um, but so I'd like to jump in here because I'd like to know where the city, the city has an officer of health and an office of health and where yeah, they and it, and, and it fit has, all this. I mean, we deal mostly with public health. I mean, it was in the news recently about the two nurses. I mean, we get the funds from the, the province, but it's the municipalities that administer the public health. So we have uh, different public uh, health nurses, um, things like the Hardship Fund where we support people with disability with dentists and, and giving them supports for, for health funds. So it's very much uh, on an individual basis. Public collective Yes, uh, but I think that where we play a big role in the healthcare is really the preventive side it, with our community centers, programming community centers, prior programming in, in, in our parks. Uh, so in, in that side we play a, re a huge role, but in, in direct healthcare it's called a health expert. Sorry? That was one of Rob's uh, issues. Yes, it was. Did it not have it? It did not have it. It was a close vote, but uh, it was a close vote. So flu shots are coming up, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. Is that the city or the province? The city. Oh, okay. Okay, I want to sort of uh, keep moving here. Um, we can spend a whole evening on healthcare. Um, education. Some educated people here, <laughs> parents. Uh, uh, I would like to know too, where sort of you know responsibilities lie as far as education policy. I know again, a pro the province seems to play a part, but then does not the federal government have a um, uh, some policy there? Some uh, and the city also delivers a lot of services too. Um, no, no, we just collect the tax. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Pass it on to the. Okay. Well, I mean, we we do, and I can start. I mean, in terms of education, we uh, we have some deals with school boards in terms of schools. Uh, we have um, uh, the libraries that some of them have programs in certain schools, and I think it's a huge component of education as well. Um, but, um, and, and we honestly will collect the, the taxes from the school board. Now, once a school is under construction, uh, obviously they have to come to the city, they have to, the city works with, uh, with uh, the community on building schools, but it's all done through, through the school board. There's actually a level of government missing here because the school boards are separate yeah. themselves. And yeah. Where I live, West Toronto Collegiate, is basically a building that's sitting there and used because it's a school board property with many millions of places mm -hmm. that have been bought by the, the French school board. But for a long time, there was a real concern that it was having to write in the city, having to write in the school trustee, and it's, there's too many levels of government. I, I know that education is a provincial responsibility. It would sure be nice to be able to just what you would like to do. Question back here. I was going to ask it probably is the school board, but who is who is in charge of the sale of the schools? Because my kids are in the French quarter, not in the scenario. But 
that there's a lot of emptying schools and buying of schools and politics about the buying of the school and the idea, who is in charge of that? Is it just the school board? It's the school board. I mean, right. it comes to the city once it's considered a surplus, just to see if the city, because right. uh, the city would have a priority uh, to uh, to use the building. Mm -hmm. So we are communicating once the, the, the school board declares um, the property a surplus, right? TDSD, the Catholic, and then the French, right? And they all operate separately, don't they? Yes. But the school boards are under a lot of pressure, right? They're, they have limited funds to run their operations from the yeah. province, and then if they can't do it, then they're, you know, then they're not allowed, I don't think, to run it up. But after, so, uh, you know, it ends up, it's, it's really provincial responsibility at the end of the day to properly fund our schools so that you know, we're not right. right. I wonder, I, it's okay, I kind of want to take a step back in some of this because, you know, I come, I've been elected official for 31 days or 32 days, but mm -hmm. before that, you know, I lived in the community uh, for a long time, I've worked here, and to me what's kind of important, and, uh, you know, I see this as more than three levels, or more than four levels on the school board, and that's, you know, that's to include the community as a really important uh, level and to think about how we use each other as leverages uh, of power, and when I say power, it's towards the public good, right, and towards the community good. And I think what's really exciting about a meeting like this is that we have all those folks, I mean, not the community is much larger, but in this community we have a really uh, exciting nucleus uh, potential here. Um, and to say that what we can offer uh, right here is, is, is two things as elected officials. And the first one, and, you know, coming from a, a social work background and somebody who brought it, you know, it's not oftentimes just direct, you know, not just, but importantly direct service to people struggling to access disability benefits or, or welfare or, you know, not sure what their, their rights are at work. We are going now to have uh, office space in this community with staff uh, that are going to be able to, to provide All people. Three of you? Uh, well, Anna has stuff you space I, too. Every, every uh, Saturday on my uh, dump uh, at uh, the Abrego Center. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, in my opinion, I think the city lost an asset in this community. Like, the, we both, you know, the part of the board, the mayor's agenda was to cut City Council's budgets to have office space. And I think that space is so valuable. And I'm in, you know, for anybody who's been trying to get in touch with me in the last month, like I've changed, so I haven't been able to get back to you. Uh, I'm looking for office space to open up and the cost of, of running an office if we have a, a finite budget too. Um, but so the one thing is just that we can, you know, where, whether it's a health issue or an education issue, you can come to our office, to Aaron's office, to Andrew's office, or to my office. And as Andrew said, we're going to. Uh, provincially and federally, we're going to make sure that when people come in and have a question, and a particular question, like, you know, it might be an idea about how we can make healthcare work more effectively, or it might just be like, uh, my friend is here uh, somewhere else that doesn't have no hip start, and how do we get our healthcare services, or, you know, whatever. That our office staff is going to be able to provide uh, that support, and they won't know all of it immediately, but they'll have access to finding out that information and supporting people. So that's the one most direct thing, and kind of the more nitty gritty of what we don't get into today, and it's gonna happen every day. You know, Andrew's office is jam packed every day with people who need support on, on immigration issues, uh, on pension issues. So we challenge all three of you to, to get one location and share offices right next to each other. Because that would be nice, and uh, from a city perspective, I think I propose this as well. Instead of, instead of it being a matter of finding a campaign office that maybe serves your interest in whatever voting block you're trying to promote, that the city or some some public level of government should own the property. And whoever gets elected, that's their constituency office. It's all yeah, every year, yeah. It's, it's accessible and it's in one one stop shopping. If you really want to help us mm -hmm. share a facility. Uh, so okay, I mean, I think I point well taken. I think when I, if I'm looking for a constituency office, I'm also trying to spread out, right? Like, so people know the riding boundaries are the same provincially and federally. They're different uh, at the city level, but provincially it stretches from Eglinton all the way down to Queen Street and from Ogden over to Western Road. So what's, what's accessible for us down here is not necessarily accessible for folks up there. So we will spread out Andrew down on College Street. I'm looking at office space further north up here. Actually, the, the, ride, the federal and provincial riding uh, embraces two full city wards plus uh, a portion of a third. So, you know, you still be on the office of the Just a suggestion. Think about it. Have a few drinks. And I'll just say a few minutes. Do you two collaborate because you're in the same party uh, on things like this? And just well, we, we, we've, uh, you know, we're, we've been working together for a couple of years. We, we share the same focus uh, on social democracy. And, uh, 
so you know, we we come from the same political family. You have to be an energy joint. You know that uh, I mean, you don't. I don't run in the party when I run. Either. And uh, and you know, I the community elected Andrew and elected Jonah, and I'm looking forward to working with them. Uh, I know that we're going to agree on a lot of things. I know how they stand on a lot of the issues, and, and I have no issue with collaborating in every possible way for good. So I'm looking forward to working with them. I see they're very energetic. They're you know young people. I think. That's the advantage of being a municipal politician. It's, it's on you. I mean, it has the advantage and disadvantage. You don't have a machine helping you, but you also, you know, you vote with your conscience and what you think you're doing for your community. And uh, and I might be wrong, but I think that the way that I've been working as well, I think Andrew and Jonah would agree with a lot of the things that I've been doing as well. I agree with that. And the point is to make sure that this neighborhood, that, that this riding has the representation and that I know we're going to need to work together on this, right? so whether it's referrals or whether it's issues, right? So I just got a, a, a credit portfolio at Queen's Park that includes uh, urban transportation, and there's a lot of stuff that happens at the city level, and, you know, uh, you know Anna and I you know, want to work to make sure that we're not losing transit services in the city, for example. Uh, but just to go back to the last one, that we, and not to get us off, oh, so to not take us off track, but, you know, I do look at what, what do we want to get done? Like, what do we need as a community? What do, our, our, what do we need personally, our family, our friends uh, need? But that, you know, immediately in terms of direct service, but then also where do we want to get to? And uh, so from an advocacy perspective, you know, you now have, you know, folks here who are, who are able to bring these things forward. And understanding how we do that most effectively uh, is, you know, in some ways, like I'm on a learning curve to figure this out. I've never been part of a caucus before. I have 16 members of my team at, uh, at Queen's Park, uh, but there's, you know, we're going to, you know, there's a process of how to how to bring things forward, and to include what I would say, like, the, the most, one of the most important stakeholders is, is us as community members, and the more that we get behind something and exert pressure, and the more I can take that to caucus and say, this is an issue, people will not, you know, it's not just one person over and over again, it is dozens or hundreds of people about this issue, so if it's a train issue. Like, I, like, we need to start, you know, working very quickly about uh, the, the air rail link uh, and to talk about it and to make sure that, you know, that I hear about it, that our caucus hears about it, and that, uh, that we bring that into the legislature. But I can bring that in as a rep, uh, so as the regional, as the person who represents this region. And in this case, and I can also bring it in as under my portfolio as a critic on transportation, on transportation. But when you have something like healthcare, uh, a concern about healthcare, you can, you know, I would advise you to send it directly to the health minister, but also to send it to me and I'll share it with our health critic. Uh, because if that's a good idea, that's something that we can introduce. And, sure. the, and the makeup of our, of the new government in Ontario is interesting, really interesting. And it's actually like, I'm on a, I'm on a very big learning curve, but so is everybody at Queen's Park right now. Like the premiers, nobody has actually been part of a minority government or a minority government that's this razor thin. So we're all going to have to figure out how to use this uh, in the best way possible to create good public policy. I have a quick question, um, specifically about education. Um, and I'm not a guru of education or ideas or anything like that, but I'm just looking around to see what's happening in the rest of the world. Okay. And, um, you know, how are we as a Canadian populist and residents of Ontario, how what are we doing to make sure that we can take a kind of advantage in tomorrow. And this is about education. So getting our young people ready at a probably an earlier age than currently and utilizing the different services that we have shown to help us have from the regular school, you know, for the regular school, i.e. um libraries, um youth centers, um, especially during the summertime, etc. These are things that are funded by the different levels of government and probably can be utilizing that to make sure that we should be get introduced to education maybe or allow different programs, or even allow different types of exposure and cultural literacy that you can create the types of programs for the, 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 the shrinking world where many different languages are spoken and cultures, etc. Et et what, what, what do you see in the provincial government's role? Or did you see some of that? Well, 
I think you named a bunch of it. I like it was a way too far. Personally, I'm not a fan of talking about competitive edge. Uh, I think that's part of the problem. I think you know we have responsibility to our business in this country to make sure that they're able to participate uh, in the communities they live in. Uh, and that's a, so that's to me. I thought it was about competition. That's about making sure that we have proper support in place and that people can uh, you know live a, a good quality of life. But I think that goes back to things. You know, I always think about where I used to work. Uh, I used to work at the Stop Community Food Center at Davenport Pennington, which is a you know, really good organization, but where a lot of people really struggle. And I worked with a volunteer there and for a long time. But one time I asked her, very close to her and to her family, and I said, what are your kids doing? So where are your kids this summer? She was a single parent. And you know, her kids were at home watching TV. And it wasn't because she was a bad parent uh, at all, right? It was back that like, uh, you know, when I grew up, parks and rec services were free, right? And it meant that this city was a lot better. And you know, if you want to use the language of competitiveness, but overall, we were, you know, had a big advantage anyway on the international stage. But we don't have that, and I think like, uh, we're losing that stuff. So the more that we invest in, you know, in the commons, in things that serve people, uh, you know, the more we reduce, you know, risk of violence. Uh, you know, like, uh, you know, we're so focused on, on on poverty and health and food access issues, and the fact that we kids going to school in the city who are hungry and they're hungry, you know, many days of the week, and you know you can't learn on that. And whether it's your kid or somebody else's kid, your kid goes to school with a kid who can't focus because they're hungry. So I mean, I think it's, it's holistic and it cuts across all levels. And you know, we're facing the unfortunate thing is that we've been facing really an austerity agenda for many years, but it's about to ramp up. And again, like we need to hear from everybody. You know, this is not great. You know, you know, nice. You know, we're at an art opening, or uh, an art project opening for a community center. I had an amazing art project that engaged people. And Anna said, you know, our mayor said, this is great. This is not great, right? And that's true, right? But we need to be unified and saying these are not. We can't. This is not waste, right? When we invest in childcare, when we invest in art programs, in music programs, in our schools, uh, this is not wasteful. And, uh, you know, we're going to be challenged there, uh, to do that you know, in this climate. If I could just you know, reiterate, I, when I say competitive advantage, I'm not, no, no, no. not in the true sense of the word, but at the same time, also in the sense of because you know, the people come where you know, children from our neighborhood or Canada and other countries will be competing for the same job. It's a competition. You know, so the most super candidates will win the competition. But what we do, I see the kids on my street, you know, luckily I live on a really 
tiny street, and the kids are always playing outside on our street. But it's like they have nowhere else to go. Okay. I just want to keep us on track here. So if we, what we, what's the question? There is, well, I'm, I'm okay. just pointing out the, the relationship between community centers, and we are talking about community centers, libraries, and those kind of social things, and the relationship from that going into the, the crime bill, which is where all the money is going. And I think if some of the money stopped going towards crime and started going into preventative measures, like uh, giving kids something to live for, that, that they wouldn't be looking at, uh, at the prison as a possible um, so can we destination. Can there be pressure applied to divert some of this money towards <coughs> youth, keeping them away from crime? Yeah, that's just some yeah. I'm, I, I'm just, you know, I, I can't this is that a single thought in my head. <laughs> this is, yeah. You know, this well, is just, I'm, I'm playing. If, I, if I might, just on that, on the, brought it up, and it is not here. The crime, the crime bill, which is this huge uh, bill Money. that that uh, the government is is putting through, and I will tell you that that this 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 crime bill uh, is comprised of nine, I think nine bills that had been separately introduced in previous parliaments, previous minority parliaments, not in the past. So they packaged them all virtually unchanged into one omnibus bill. And and in that bill there is a there is one part of it which is deals with the protection of children, uh, protecting children from uh, predatory uh, sexual exploitation. Okay. So we said for example we said, okay, well, well, we support this, and we, and most of the language in, in the bill actually was what came from NDP private members' bills from previous parliaments. So we said, okay, let's we we um, put forth a motion to to uh, take that part of that part of the bill out of the omnibus bill, and then we pass it right away, and within 48 hours it'll be back to uh, the House for third reading. So. The government, um, not only did they vote down that motion, so it went like this. We introduced the motion, there was a vote, we lost the vote. In other words, that motion, that part of the, of the bill stayed within the zombie bus law. So, and then the next speaker up was a conservative who uh, spent 10 minutes talking about how important this law about protecting children was and how we needed to pass it right away and why did the NDP hate why are the NDP, you know, make oh, it okay. easier for for <laughs> pedophile pedophiles to uh, exploit children. This is the kind of of, of thing we're dealing with here, right? So so uh, and then they uh, introduced um, uh, a motion to limit debate on this huge bill that they won't even tell us how much it's gonna cost. Uh, uh, you know, so it's, it's very serious stuff. But but just to the point of um, of pushing back and, and bringing up, you know, sort of a, an alternative vision. I, I, it's important to say to, to say to you that that what we're doing now in the last four years, and and hopefully the outcome of that conversation is going to be a different direction. And so so I I will say just and I know what. We're talking about all sorts of things. We're talking about constituency work. We're talking about how the different jurisdictions work. But we're also talking about we have, we cannot not talk about politics too. And 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 so you you need to know, and I'm sure most of you do that that it is a long game we're playing here. You know that 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 the, the government has a majority. They are they are using it to the maximum uh, way that they can. They are limiting debate. They are uh, making committee work almost, uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, not worth doing for for most of us because they completely control the agenda. Uh, so it's very, very difficult. So we have to find other ways of, of animating the conversation, other ways of, of trying to further an agenda that that, quite frankly, more than 60% of voters voted for. Um, and uh, so that's what we're doing. So with the crime bill, I just wanted to say one quick other thing. Um, the government has three times tried to introduce a, a legislation that would compel your internet service provider um, 
to gather all your information, your email, all of your web traffic, all of that stuff, and hold it. And if law enforcement ever wanted to put you under surveillance for whatever reason, they don't even have to give a reason, they just contact your ISP and your ISP would have to give law enforcement that information. So we have serious concerns about this. This is a privacy issue, it's a civil liberties issue, and not, not only that, you know, the cost of maintaining, storing and maintaining this data, it will ultimately be borne on the consumer, so there's a consumer issue there too. And I just bring it up and, and you only to say, we're doing an event, a public uh, forum on this issue down at 99 Sudbury on November 18th. I've left some flyers on the desk. Uh, we've got, we've lined up some of the top experts in this field. Uh, it's going to be an amazing event, and it's really an event for our community to to understand the issue uh, and to find out ways in which we can push back. The government hasn't introduced this legislation again, but they, but we want to build enough momentum and pressure to dissuade them from attempting to do it. These are the kinds of ways in which we are are trying to work with what we've got in Ottawa. So there's also a petition down there too, uh, and I, I, I'm going to be introducing this petition over, a, I'm hoping, over like eight or nine days uh, in the House. And again, this is just a public record. It's a historical document that cannot be erased that says, you know what? We have real concerns about this. So I just, that was just a little plug and also a little um, comment on the crime. There's lots going on. There's, there's lots of ways to attack it, but I, I think the, the, a common thread here that I think is interesting is the well-being of our youth. I have a couple of kids. That involves all of our levels of government in ways that you've already described, and lots of other ways. Um, just to throw one thing into the pot, uh, you know, my involvement with Dr. Park over the last many years, and, and you have been involved with it for since 1993, I think. We've done our impression, and it's only an impression, is that probably 25 or 30 percent of the budget of our forestry and recreation is wasted. Um, if you take into account the, you know, all the unnecessary procedures, you know, the kind of thing that we've been going through recently, virtually their whole planning department, which is I think 30, 30 full-time people, they keep churning out these plans, and most of them never really <coughs> see the light of day, and so on. So <coughs> I mean, it's an impression. I mean, who knows? It could be 10%, it could be 30%, but it's quite crazy. They're, well, it's not gravy in that sense, though. It's not gravy in the sense of people at the trough. It's, it's, it's an explicit um, uh, management style, uh, which they themselves do not see as unnecessary. And, and very confusing. I mean, we've been having meetings yeah. with uh, staff, it's very with you to almost yeah. on a regular basis. The amount of supervisors and managers, and sometimes you don't know how to meet and we're like, hey, who is this person now? <laughs> yeah. Because, and then it, it, it is, I mean, it's, it's a huge department that, that so really could use some. So management is, I think management is an issue in terms of getting results for us, people in the community. I think innovation is, a, is, is another issue, uh, which, is, which is really important. Um, Dr. and Park, I mean, the thing that used to impress me about Dufferin Park is not happening so much because they're under a lot of pressure, but, you know, you know the cookie money there, they've got all this food going on at Dufferin Park, and it comes up to, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. And um, I remember one instance in particular where they gave $100 to somebody to uh, help kids make clay figures for three days. Uh, I mean, it might seem insignificant, but if, you know, if you create an environment that allows that kind of you know, in terms of in terms of yeah, in terms absolutely. of child, you know, engaging kids, and as if you all walk through, you know that there's a lot of basketball players there all the time. That's because uh, you have basically said to them all, "We're not going to get in your way if you give us a basketball court." This is ages for But I mean, there's innovation there, and yet, um, you know, as we speak, part of forestry and recreation management has said, "Well, we know Dufferin is great, but it really doesn't conform." And, you know, where's the accountability? And they're methodically uh, unpacking and interfering and, and 
demoral, you know, and all kinds of things to try to impose what I call what I call technocracy. Um, there's a philosophical issue, you know, there's funding issues. I mean, there's all kinds of things in terms of education. You know, we've got the dropout rate, you know, which is which is very much involved with uh, kids engaging uh, in their, you know, feeling they can engage in their society. And all that stuff. It's very complicated. Um, but so management, innovation, and I would say openness. If I could introduce only three of what must be an endless list of issues here, um, but I think they involve everybody, and I think it's critical. I mean, I've got two kids, and I'm really worried about what the world is going to look like after I pass away. Which I'm not happy with it at all. One question that might t- might tie things together a little bit here to get to a question is the concept of an open government, of, of sort of open sourcing government, as it were. Um, you've probably heard about this in various ways. City of Toronto, toronto.ca slash open, is the beginning of what's supposed to be a general initiative to free information uh, about the city so that community groups like us, if uh, we get passionate about something, can actually get information that supports that in some way, that, that informs that passion, you know, in a, in a concrete way. Facilitates engagement. Facilitates engagement, you know, tries to get some results. So on the one hand, the city of Toronto had this open, open uh, initiative. On the other hand, uh, you know, through, uh, through the Center for Local Research and Public Space, you know, all various initiatives that she's done, trying to get information from the city on specific matters like point T. She, she, she swears that they've got a unit desk at the Freedom of Information Office downtown because of the number of, of times that she's forced to make a formal request for for specific information, which by the way, public. It, well, it, you know, so so I mean, there's that there's that tension there, and I think it probably applies to some degree in other levels of government. By the way, Park PFNR has a reputation of being probably one of the worst run bureaucracies that I'm aware of. I think public health has a much better reputation. Certainly, the library has a better reputation. My general impression of the federal bureaucracy is that it's better than the city bureaucracy. I don't know about the provincial bureaucracy so much. But the thing is that all of this is so complex. I'm just trying to suggest that there's there's one, and I'm sure there are many others, but there's one way to try to open it up, which is to support anything that you can do to open information, to open government, uh, to allow, uh, open source it, really, to allow groups like ours to easily get information in order to inform the causes, all of which we have. I mean, I've got, you know, if there okay, was... Let's, let's, let's get a response. Yeah, I, I, it's, I'm trying to focus, believe it or not, a little bit. Is that helpful? I mean, as, as a discussion. And I think since you started with the parks, I can start. I mean, um, like I said, we've been working, I've been working with you mostly, and I agree By the way, Anna's been doing a great job for us. Um, and uh, I'm all for having the information. I mean, you can't ask people to come and volunteer and give their advice. A lot of times we're asking for people's advice about the fact at the table. And in order to do that, we need, we, we had to ask staff to give more information that was, uh, was being provided. Um, you know, I, I have my own budget town hall, uh, for example, and, you know, make sure that our ready scheduled mine because this year is going to be crazy. Uh, a lot of councillors will have a problem not even be able to have a bunch of town hall this year because of the timing that everything is being done. It's, uh, I mean, we do have the advantage of having the end of the year uh, closer to be our end of the year to have a budget early in, in 2012. But the time that we have to consult on communities to have a, a, a budget process that really engages the community is very short with the holidays in the middle. Um, so, uh, I think I was the, the, the second one to put in a request to have staff come into our community, but they told me right away that a lot of people are not that, a lot of counselors are not going to have that opportunity just to be staff and have the time. Um, so <coughs> we are facing some, some challenges in, in that sense as well, but I think uh, I, I agree with you. I think that we can do to have more people engaged. And if there's one thing that I think we're getting at the city of Toronto, is engagement. There's no question sure. about it. People are engaged. People are talking about municipal issues. People are talking about the city. People want to get involved. Um, there's no question about it. That's, 
Uh, sorry? Because they're worried. Exactly, exactly. But it, it is, I mean, people people are getting passionate and they're getting, uh, they're getting involved. There's no question about it. Well, the deputations, the Occupy movement, yeah. these kinds of things are not and, happening. And uh, I, have, I just have a question about that. You saw the recent installation that uh, Dave Metzl did, right? Yes, I guess I would well, check it out, but I mean, yeah. it sort of speaks to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. opening up City Hall. You have to get down to City Hall to do it. No, it's at 401 Richmond. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah, I, I actually thought, I was excited to think it was at City Hall. Well. Okay. Yeah. But still, it's good. Yeah. It's an art show. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's how to access City Hall, correct? Yeah. And he has some brilliant ideas about how to access Okay, let's, let's keep on track. Okay. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, we talked to child care briefly. Uh, I know they're, the Liberals way back when were sort of trying to implement a national policy and Harper got in, I believe the extent of his policy is 100 bucks a month for every kid and every family uh, before tax. Um, uh, the provincial level had the early years uh, learning program and I know as, uh, from best experience the city has a lot of services for kids at the on the ground level. I'm wondering if maybe we could talk about the, the, the boundaries for child care and if this is maybe an area where the three of um, you uh, could really come together and uh, to affect some change. Well, I know there's some areas where you can but there's, I think I'm talking about before we leave time, areas where there can be some. Uh, in conjunction with with us, you know, yeah. writing letters, doing what yeah. we can. Yeah. Well, there's no question. I mean, it is one of the biggest issues uh, facing people in our, in our area, in our, in our writing. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a social justice issue. This is a, uh, this is a, an issue for, for women in particular, and uh, it's, it's, it's just generally outrageous. And as a parent, and I, as well, I've gone through the stress of of uh, precarious child care and uh, uh, it's, it's a real sad comment on the values that, that are being <coughs> promoted in our society that we can't come up with a solution. Now, $100 a month is no solution and in fact, uh, I'd argue that it's uh, it, it $100 a month from the federal government uh, earmarked for child care not only doesn't provide any child care, it drains public coffers in a very, uh, you know, destructive way. Um, and so we aren't actually building any kind of framework, which is what the federal government can do in this situation. Uh, it's what we're trying to do with our national tra uh, public transit strategy. The federal government can build a framework uh, for some kind of baseline, um, accessible, affordable child care in our country. And uh, this government is it's not just fiscally against it, it is philosophically against this kind of thing. And uh, so this is one of the narratives that, that, you know, one of the stories that we are, you know, are telling and, and we'll be talking about over the next four years is, is, is that we're hanging parents out to dry. And in a city like Toronto, and I argue this in, in the House of Commons every time I get up and I get people from all parties, including my own, kind of looking at me like, why is this dude always talking about Toronto? Well, I talk about it because we have particular issues here that uh, you know they that that you know we need addressed. I mean, we need we need uh, that need to be addressed. And so the affordability piece is huge. I mean, you know, if, if child care is going to be twelve, it's costing twelve hundred dollars a month. That's a huge drain on our economy, not not just not just your own personal pocketbook. So. So I think our, our issue is providing a framework. The provincial government is, uh, is the one that will be delivering it. I mean, it's a big issue right now. Some of those, you know, uh, a full day kindergarten is a good thing, but one of the you know, probably most foreseen consequences of that has been underfunding of uh, really child care, right? Uh, and we need to make sure the child care centers stay open and they're fully funded. Um, I think it's an interesting idea about working together on on something like child care and involving the community. It's certainly a riding where child care is a huge issue. You know, we know that we're not going to have the worst here. Young families have moved into this neighborhood, not because it's affordable, but because it's more affordable than any other places. Um, you know, from my background,
background again, working on poverty issues, child care is one of the big things that keeps people living in poverty when they can't afford to go out and work. Um, you know, I think that one of the things we, we should talk about uh, doing, and it kind of goes back, and it's based on child care, but talk goes back to your like, you know, concern about how we understand these systems is, uh, you know, how do we use our resources to make sure that we bring people in? So child care is one of the most complicated ones in my uh, files in terms of the way it cuts across different levels. Uh, but we can, you know, one open source thing, it's very old fashioned, what we're doing right here, right? And we're getting some information here today, but there's a lot more information that we can share in a community forum. And I think overall, uh, that's a good thing in terms of building the kind of city and province and country that we want is, is to build, you know, is to bring the political will together uh, when we bring people together and, and realize we can't afford these things. Uh, so I would recommend that we, you know, at some point, let's host a meeting where we bring in an expert on child care, somebody that advocates for child care uh, full time. So to bring in like the Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care and let them uh, give us all the information and engage us in the advocacy work that would hit all levels and, and push on that issue. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's really... And the summer parks used to have really, really uh, affordable programs and they're getting more expensive. If I can, this is uh, a, a, an issue that I really use the example of help on child care. Um, we just had a, a, a report released uh, on Friday um, that uh, actually had a very interesting the results of the implementation of all day kindergarten. Uh, it, it's, it's great, it's a great program, but what happens is that our child care centers are funded by uh, uh, monies that the city allocates. The city has 20,000 subsidies and then some people pay full, full scale. Now, the older children are much cheaper to uh, take care of than the little ones, the toddlers. So they're in a way subsidizing the toddlers. By taking away the older kids into the all-day kindergarten, oh, it's oh, becoming oh, a lot more expensive. Yeah. So we actually, if we don't get in the next few years, 27 million dollars from the, the provincial government, we're going to see all kinds of childcare being closed in the city of Toronto. We're going to have a crisis of this childcare services. For example, in our area, it's not even about subsidies, which are already already have a crisis, right? But it's also about to have people that will want to have a full a, a space and not have a space paying full rate yes. because the centers just can't survive because just 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 not. So we just uh, we are going to the province uh, because we obviously need more subsidies because next year the subsidies you know the money that the city has allocated is, is finishing and we also need huge help with uh, mitigating this effect of the all day uh, kid burden. We also have on the other hand. Um, 55 uh, daycare centers that are run by the city. Uh, and it's still at the table. I mean, there's always a possibility of the current administration wanting to privatize those child care. Now, um, some people say, you know, we could have other organizations running the child care like nonprofit. The reality is that um, the, the child care centers and whoever has children, I'm sure, knows about this, they're rated. And the municipal run child care centers always have the best rating. Uh, they, they, they're they very good at what they do. And so it is very important that they will continue to have these 50 I'm, I'm actually organizing a meeting in our board um, with Mothers for Child Care. This is actually something that Councillor Janet Davis started in her ward, and now there's a group of parents that are getting involved in here to talk about these issues because we have a crisis looming in the city of Toronto and we need to work their support to make sure that uh, the provincial government is going to listen to what the city is going to be asking for and obviously we're going to be inviting uh, Jonah to, to, to be at the table as well. One thing I don't understand about full day, uh, full day kindergarten and all that, I mean it's not really full day. So if your kid was in daycare, you did, the kid would be in daycare until you got out of work at five or six or after you got home from work, whatever. And, and now, and like, so will anybody pay, be picking up the slack? But That's schools get out at three, and, and who's going to work from the seven? Yeah. Who's going to work from seven to nine, and from three to six? So you're going to have people doing these two shifts. But I mean, the school is open from nine till three. So it, it, I remember when my daughter was in daycare, it was really impossible to find a childcare spot 
that would be open at a time to facilitate me getting to the to the gig and me getting home in time. And and so I mean, will they be opening up things like no, after your There's only program? four right now in the city of Toronto that have extended hours. So there's four and over ninety of them that are already in full full day kindergarten that have extended hours. Yeah, I was just Two kids, one in grade one and one in junior kindergarten, both at full day school. Both the eldest one would be dropped off and would be able to be picked up at the daycare, but they will neither pick up my son from the same exact bus because the person from the room can't come out to get him from the bus, and then I would have to pay full day daycare for him. Thank God for my mother. But that's you know, there's like there's no way around it anywhere. So these issues really have to be worked with the, the province and we really need the province to come and help the city of Toronto with this, otherwise it's going to be... It's, and, and if you look at the map, um, most, I mean, the, the, what we call the priority neighborhoods all around the city, I mean, it, it, it's a disaster. A lot of them will, will be, they uh, have very, very few dangerous I think Anna, like I'd love to get that information brought to our caucus. You know, we have opportunities to ask questions in question period, and I'd like to ask the local government, you know, what when we're going to get the funding to make sure uh, that we can keep childcare open. I was interested about the political will too, and you know, I think that's something we've got to work to create. As we back, you know, there was actually a general strike when they raised uh, a childcare fee from five dollars a day to seven dollars a day, right? And we can't even dream about what seven dollar a day child care would look at. So it's, it's doable. Uh, it's, you know, we can't be with we can't let them tell us that, that it can't be done. Uh, we got you know, but we, we have to, you know, we need we need that information to know, you know, brought to our caucus, uh, you know, brought to the proper lines and, and you know the more clear those lines are between the community, you know, and all levels of government, the more powerful we are. Um, and, and just to go back to, to again to the question of openness, because I think that's sort of what this meeting is about. Is, is trying to make sure that we have the most open lines of communication. So I mean, this is a really good start, in, in my opinion. Uh, for me personally, I mean, uh, and Andrew and Anna already have newsletters, online newsletters for people who have access to the internet. You know, get online newsletter. It will it, it be a little bit dormant right now. Uh, you know, trying to keep up to date, but it will be a regular uh, way to keep in touch about what's happening. Um, in the neighborhood, if you've got school kids, you know, so we're through your website? Yeah, and right now it's through the election website. So if you go to electronshine.com, you'll get on it and you can sign on it, sign up for it there. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, but going forward, I mean, like, if you have kids, you know, I'm gonna, we're gonna, my constituents work, they're gonna have to make sure that we invite all the kids in this neighborhood. We've got a very civically engaged adult population that's growing, uh, increasingly engaged adult population in, in, in the politics. We need kids to be engaged. And so, uh, the nice thing about Queen's Park, there's kids there all the time, and we should make sure it takes a while to get kids in, but to, to get kids through, to tour through there, you're welcome to come to Queen's Park to, you know, to sit and, and observe. And Hansard is, you know, they call it the Facebook of uh, the house. It, everything's recorded there, so if you, and it comes out every night, you can see just, I mean, if you feel like reading it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's online? It's online? Yeah, it's online, yeah. and you can read it. Uh, but I mean, I think what happens in the city, the city hall is the most acceptable right now form of politics. Uh, you can always off watch yeah. Bill Rogers and have, uh, make some fun of us. <laughs> <laughs> Where's my hobby? <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to say the open source thing is actually most specifically for computer nerds. It's to, it's to get the information in raw form so it can be repackaged and can I just finish it? So it can be repackaged and redone and you know it's about it's about uh, there is a lot of information on the Toronto in terms of raw data. There's a lot of information on the Toronto website and in the newsletters. To some extent, it's our responsibility as well to help uh, our politicians spread that on on discussion groups. And you know, if the newsletter comes out, tell people about it. Post it on, you know, the Duff and Grow. Post it on, you know, just share it out because you guys, you know, you guys can't possibly reach everybody. You need to rely on on, on people to network with each other and, and, and spread the word. That's an exciting spirit, and part of why I was really happy to be in this. 
like why you know why I still have to run this track is because people are interested in this and interested interested in constructive engagement, right? Uh, you know, a lot of times we find ourselves just oppositional uh, with government. We go well, along. I mean, in terms of Toronto.ca, there's, there's a ton of information on that website. Uh, it's just a matter of getting it in front of people's eyes and perhaps contextualizing it. And hopefully, that's something that will be done in the various newsletters to just help us put that information in, 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 in contact. And then. We have to do the work as well to spread that to our neighbors. You know, we could only win elections by having huge volunteer teams. Uh, you know, straight up, right? That's how we built. You know, we built an amazing community-based organization here in the last, you know, couple of years. Uh, but you know, it's very, you know, it really uh, feels important to me that we continue to engage the community and make it. You know, there's only so much that three folks can do on their own. But when you know, we open the doors for each other when we work together, there's a lot more that we can do. So, you know, I encourage you to get involved informally, however you want to, through your own networks, but also, you know, through through our offices, you know, to help with that sort of stuff. I can just squeeze a few more minutes out of tonight because it's rare for us to have all three of you here together. Um, and talk about public transit. Uh, because I know there's, uh, you're trying to get a national policy, but I know uh, the city and the province has initiatives and plans and they're dealing with public transit. Mm -hmm. I'd like to put that on the floor just to finish off. Yeah, yeah well, <coughs> um, yeah, we, we have introduced a, uh, a national public transit uh, strategy and, uh, and it's being uh, looked at in uh, the Transit Infrastructure Committee right now. Um, that was a huge uh, accomplishment and achievement um, that Olivia Chow was able to to, to make because I, I can tell you that it's very rare that an opposition motion or an opposition private member's bill is going to reach a committee to actually uh, so that we actually can invite witnesses and and really kind of get into this idea of, of, of the importance of public transit and the needs that municipalities have around uh, around stable um, Predictable funding from senior levels of government. So, so you know, one of the big problems we have here is that uh, the TTC can't afford to operate the system it has currently, let alone uh, operate an expanded system that it needs. And uh, so, uh, so our plan uh, would provide uh, this, you know, eight, not not full, you know, it's not saying it's going to fund all public, the operating costs of all public transit in all municipalities across Canada, but it provides a framework where where a system like Toronto Transit would be able to count on on some stable funding from for operating. The, the federal government likes to spend money on capital projects, uh, you know, because then they can put a big billboard up there and attend a ribbon cutting and get some credit and some political uh, juice out of them, right? But, uh, but funding the operating the operations of a public transit system isn't necessarily the sexiest investment the federal government uh, wants to make. So we're, we're, gonna, we're so our proposal, uh, you know, sort of institutionalizes this. And we have, you know, compelling arguments, economic, social justice, environmental arguments, why we need this in municipalities uh, right across the country, mayors, even Rob Ford spoke favorably of, uh, of our uh, transit. Well, I don't know how favorably he, he, he spoke, but a little, <laughs> a little quote that was used was favorable. <laughs> <laughs> he knew Does it have it. the shepherd's subway there? <laughs> 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 so, so anyway, what, the, you know, the other thing is, and, and, and we know that, that a lot of uh, transit um, uh, development in Toronto has been chaotic, to say the least. Uh, and and so this would would help to uh, this, this this national public transit framework work would help provide some stability and, and get a little of chaos and a little bit of politics out of public transit. Uh, eventually, I mean, it's a big issue. And, and traditionally, public transit has been funded properly uh, by the Ontario government up until. Uh, the Harris government, there was stable, there's a 50-50 split in operating costs. 
and we lost that funding permanently to this point. So it was, you know, one of the one it it's never it's never come back. And so the problems that we see uh, both around, you know, the lack of investment, you know, the or just the failure of our transit system to, to serve our city uh, is due, you know, it's large part because it hasn't been funded properly. And, and so what I, one of the things I was most proud about in our provincial platform was a promise to go back and do a funding formula where we have 50% funding for public transit from Ontario. I think would also, you know, take some of the pressure off the city's budget uh, not to fund the whole thing. Uh, it was conditional, uh, the, the platform piece on a fair increase too, because uh, you know, a lot of people have a very difficult time uh, accessing the city. Uh, <coughs> and, you know, right now we're looking at a 10%, well, I'll let Anna talk, but there's a, there's a, you know, and then cut to uh, to the services that are the services that already do not work. Uh, and I think just to make it clear that it's not it is an environmental issue, uh, but it's also like you know Board of Trade has said that we lose you know billions of dollars in uh, in public innovation uh, every year. Yeah. Five, five <coughs> not activity just by sitting in traffic. And actually, we have you know I don't know if anyone's been to Los Angeles and got stuck in traffic there, but but we are our, our commute time. In Toronto is yeah, the worst in in North America, I believe, but it's at least it's worse than Los Angeles, and that's hard to believe. Uh, but I'm not, I'm saying it's not in traffic. Way. It's actually all too. Yeah. I'd like to ask Jonah what he can do with the uh, provincial government. Do you guys think that you can get conservatives to be on side with that? Not, I mean, this is the politics. Of it. So the question is, how do we build uh, the will within the government? That. Uh, the exciting thing, you know, I think for me, for this community, the fact that I've been, uh, that Andrew Horvath gave me is, uh, the credit portfolio that includes uh, urban transportation is very exciting. You know, it means that we're going to put dedicated energy into those issues. And, you know, Java, of course, is a natural uh, place to have advocacy on it. Uh, and you have to remember, I mean, whether it's the makeup of the government or the makeup of the province, right? Like, cities around our city and cities across the province are counting on us in some ways. Because uh, you know public transit is just not going to happen way up north at this point, right? And and we so we need to make sure that we're fighting hard uh, for it, you know, you know, here and down for and leading the way for the I mean, municipalities. Yeah, we're facing in the city. We're going to be facing some very tough decisions this year. I think right now um, the mayor wants our every department to cut 10 percent. So TTC is trying to cut 10 percent. So there's probably going to be some bus routes again that are going to be. Uh, there's going to be uh, uh, most likely, I would say, almost 100% a 10 cent increase on the GTC here. Um, and, uh, and this doesn't address the, uh, the billions of dollars that we need to, to invest to replace our fleet. I mean, we have 234 streetcars uh, that we desperately need. I mean, anybody that even lives in our area around Queen or Kings or uh, even College Street, it's, it's, it's completely packed. We really need the new street come in as soon as possible. Uh, there's new subway cars that need to come in. Um, so all this investment is, is has already been committed. I'm very concerned that this administration tries to back out to some of these of these commitments because these are stuff that we need. Um, so we, we really need um, the, the help of the province, absolutely. Um, it would be amazing if we get 50% of our operating costs back to that, but we also need a huge investment in our infrastructure. And people, you know, there's always this thing, you know, uh, with the Shepherd subway, and people say, oh, don't you want subways? You know, I think that if we ask anybody in the city of Toronto, they like subways, everybody wants subways. It's the same thing as asking me, do you want a $5 million home? Of course I want a $5 million home. Well, can I afford it? Can I, you know, live in it and, and, and uh, uh, even clean a million dollar home? Maybe not. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe not. And so, um, I mean, it, it, what, what we had, it was a, a, a plan that was going to affect a lot of neighborhoods and it was going to benefit a lot of neighborhoods and it was going to bring us some solution uh, for the, the next 30 to 40 years. And, uh, and so those neighborhoods still need to be looked at. Um, now, uh, I think that we also in this province, and, and maybe I'm going into something that is not my jurisdiction, um, is that, uh, I mean, there, there is a plan called the big, the, 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 uh, the, the regional plan, but honestly, if we don't start talking about things like road tolls, and it's going to be very hard to, to, to move into, into these big plans, and I think as politicians, we have to be less scared to start talking 
talking and to have some idle conversations because that's the only way we're going to have to to fund this huge investment that we infrastructure the investment that we need in our in our and, uh, in our is city. It, trying to city truly dead? I mean, David Miller says it would take five minutes to. No, it's not truly that. I think I think a lot of that is also the provincial uh, provincial uh, issue too. I mean, the, the McGinty government uh, sort of caved to Ford and and allowed to allow the the earmark funding for transit city to go into the Eglinton Crosstown, and you know, so there's some big issues there. I mean, and and I I'm going to be very interested to see how this plays out when. Uh, when the legislature, provincial legislature, the comes back. The thing is, for example, now with the, they're starting to do the environmental assessment from the uh, or LRT to the part that was supposed to be above ground and then they decided to go underground. They're finding all kinds of problems. So it might even not be possible. So they might <laughs> have to go back to yeah. the drawing board. So. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the point is, and we'll, oh, sorry, go ahead, because we're about ready to talk. support what you guys are saying in that um, you both alluded to different constituencies. There's a constituency for infrastructure. Um, for instance, the people who dig the underground tunnels are very major contractors who um, are major, major constituents, naming names specifically. For instance, SSG Lablin, they are, they practically own our country. I mean, not to put too fine a point on it. They are the people who are lobbying for this infrastructure. The people who need to lobby for the operating and the future are us. And, and, it's and that's our a job, huge too, right? Job. Yeah, exactly. And so yeah. I'm glad to hear that you're all kind of on the same page with regards to that. So just a statement in support of what you're all saying. Fred had his hand up there. Yeah, I just want to, I don't know who declared it so, but apparently this is Transportation Month right now. And the, I, I, I don't know whether anybody's heard of, anybody else has heard about that or who no. declared it so, but, but there, there's tons of stuff yeah, going on. Uh, especially in terms of academically, there, there's a form tomorrow night. It's a ticketed event, but it's it's run by the city center. There's an all-day session on Thursday at at the uh, New Witchwood Barns, which is a collaboration of the Center for City Ecology, City Center. Uh, one of the things that's being talked about there is you know the importance of let's get let's get beyond transit. Let's not ever and 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 we want them to pull themselves out of poverty, we want them to take responsibility for themselves, and we're not letting them get to work. Yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge inequity in our city uh, that so many of our city has poor access to public transit. I mean, it's I mean, you know, the advantage that, that even though, you know, you get stuck in the duck or bus, for a long time tonight, for example, uh, you know, we have a we we have a huge advantage to be say, close to a subway line, um, and we it's incumbent on us to to work towards building a more equal and a more fair city. Otherwise, down the road in 20 years, we are going to have some serious problems. Well, I mean, we've got serious problems now, uh, and and I agree with you that we did we shouldn't get wrapped up in the names and the packaging, you know. But we do have to, you know, occasionally pause and consider that that plan, you know, was eight or nine years in the making, and yeah. you don't, you don't well, fund the project. Let's get the plan back for that today. Let's get the right. plan you know, back so for if that yeah. works.
us as a country because you know, Canada is unique in certain cases the size of it. We're very open to people who don't look at ourselves as what we are. You know, the vast parts of the country are unpopulated, or you know, are scarcely populated by what we have. The major cities are in the same as well. Toronto is one of them. Calgary is an emerging monster, just in the next 10 years. Vancouver is another one of them. You know, so we have some major centers around the country that are you know, growing. How much of each one of those cities, how much of the line of like because of congestion costs in these cities? And that, that figure, that number, needs to be something that the federal government should look at and say, well, if it's just 5% of those in Toronto, it might be 4 or 5% in Vancouver, or it might be another yeah. 4 or 5 million dollars in Cal. Well, yeah. let's yeah. do something about this so that we can actually save and curve on all of that money <coughs> and spend the infrastructure, which is actually going to create jobs, yeah. which goes back Absolutely. to you know, our economy. So it's just you know, instead of just sitting back and counting numbers that are just going out the window, yeah. let's actually just keep it yeah. So I, I hope that in Ottawa they're also in this conversation that, you know, let's look at some quantifiable numbers that you have. Yeah. It might be just this much in this city, but this is yeah. actually possible. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, can I make another comment um, for the NDPers up there since we're maybe being there's a couple of um, major unions that are probably standing in the way of this kind of equitable transit bill. Well, on that subject, if you look at the provincial uh, <laughs> donors list, you'll find that uh, unions donated more to the Liberal Party than they did to the NDP in the last provincial election. So, possibly there's a reason for that. <laughs> so I just just want to say that you know we we don't you know control any unions and they don't certainly control us. We are in co we are in collaboration. We are partners with some. There's no question about that. But the union movement is a very large and uh, sort of, and it's, and it's not a homogenous movement either. There's a real diversity of opinion and a diversity of politics as well. I'm not sure I understand the question or your comments, but you're saying that the unions are getting in the way of public funding public transit? Well, specifically the CAW, certainly the Liberal Party, and well, I don't know if you remember, but it was it was the outgoing president of the CAW, uh, Buzz Hargrove, who gave a warm embrace to Prime Minister Paul Martin and sort of signaled that, you know, I, I just, yeah, that they're not, we're not necessarily all speaking to each other as, so, as closely as your comment suggests. Well, don't only take it on the my NDP comment, take it on the... As yeah. The, as a okay, fair enough. And, and informational and something that you know, certain people who are involved in transit are certainly aware that that is a huge lobby that is interfering with. Oh, listen, well, no question it. about it. I mean, it comes down to it's not just the automakers and the jobs that they create; it's the advertising that car companies um, pay for in magazines and newspapers. You know that they're some of the biggest advertisers on television, yeah. in print media. So it's a, it's a, you know, I mean, you're, you touched on another big issue, you know, that, that a, as you recall, when Rob Ford got elected, he said that the war on the car yeah. was over. And, you know, I thought, well, I think if there was a war on the car, if there was, and that's a big if, uh, that war was over a long time ago. <laughs> and the car won. You know, so, so I think that what you're trying to say is that there is a large systemic <laughs> issue here. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and and point well taken, and, and there's no question about it. And 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 you know, you know, it, it's also it is it is a complex issue for for many people because jobs are a factor, right? And I think that what we need to do in this issue around transit, and in many other issues, because we're talking about moving our economy and our society in a different direction. Of course, that's sort of a slow move, but we do need to stress the economic import and impact of moving to a greener economy. Uh, we need to talk about things like the, the cost of gridlock and, and how that how that's crippling our economy. Absolutely. And for too long those those major players have had a large share of the of the debate. And I think it's exciting that this that's starting to change. Okay, so we have to uh, wrap it up, Richard. Yeah, I, I actually have a request, not a question. Um, 
This is a really exciting time in our ward and our riding because we have three new elected officials. Um, and it, being here for 10 years, I've noticed historically that there has always been a very disjointed relationship <coughs> historically between all of the elected officials from the three levels of government. And we discovered this when we were dealing with the electric train issues that, you know, just trying to get all levels of government to talk about this, no one was talking to each other, no one knew what was going on. Um, and, and I just would like to know that um, this is a really good opportunity since it's a new time that we'll see some real open communication and cooperation between the three of you. I know that John and Andrew, you both come from the same party and you already have a relationship with each other, so I'm hoping you won't disclude Anna from this at all. Um, we see her more than we see you guys, I think, just because it, it is more of a municipal thing. But we're hoping that you guys, you know, will be nice, nice, friendly, friendly, drink beers together, and and sort of work together on our behalf. I think that would be something new for us, having all three levels sort of feeling like having all three levels on our side and feeling like they're actually communicating with each other. So I'm not going to make you like you know prick your finger and do a blood vessel thing, but well, why it, not? Yeah, <laughs> but but just knowing that you guys are happy to sort of say yes, we're willing to work together for us, you know what I mean, would make me really happy. <laughs> Why are you looking at me? <laughs> you have to left us. Yeah, I think yeah. historically. Yeah, historically. Well, historically, the position, right? Yeah, I know, you not know, you. I've, I've been the MP for, for six months. Yes. Yeah. Seven months. No, not you, you. Yeah, yeah. Not you. No, and, and you know, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we talked a lot about in the election and I'm bound and, de and determined to do is, is to make the office of your member of parliament more accessible. That, you know, there's no reason that that shouldn't happen, except for the fact that physically uh, I'm, I'm in Ottawa, you know, quite a lot. And so there's that. Um, but, yeah, for sure, the, uh, the, the office and, and who I am, and 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 what my staff uh, do, uh, and just my general presence in the riding. I mean, should be more, and and I I'd argue that it is already more, you know, more, uh, you know, available, more visible, more accessible than than it had been in the past. And uh, and we continue to, to get more like that. And you know, look, we are a community. You know, we have some different. You know, we 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 have. We'll have different opinions about about some things, you know. But uh, you know, I think that there is a there is a sense. I mean, we go to a ton of the same events. We're we're involved in many of the same issues. That we're going to be working together. I think, and I think it's an exciting time for all of us. I would add to that. To think about the to think about it more. Uh, in addition to Andrew or to Anna and I, but to think about the team that we bring. I mean, Andrews, team, uh, Melissa, Bruno, Stephanie, the pieces. These are incredible community assets. Uh, they are helping people every day. And in Ottawa, we've got legislative duties. I mean, I'll be at Queen's Park part of the year, so, but you know, I'll be around more than Andrew will just because of, uh, I mean, it's, it's in my workplace in the same city. But, you know, the team that, that I put together, and I think these are community resources that, that you should see as, as, you know, yours to help with the kind of, you know, your immediate needs, but also pushing this stuff forward. Uh, I mean, there's lots of common grounds we've had. You know, Andrew and I, in our campaign, and yes, it's true, we've been working closely together, Andrew and I, but that's a really, uh, it's part of my excitement to doing this, is working with somebody like Andrew, because we do share uh, a lot of values, a lot of passions about this, but we both ran on urban uh, agendas, right. right? And Anna's our urban representative, and Anna and I was like, we're, we're going to work together. I, you know, I'm going to, Anna was running against me. The truth is that Anna supported the candidate against me uh, in the campaign, and that was, that's, the way politics shakes down, but we have lots of years where we need to work productively together. So I will you know, put that to rest and uh and Good. Well, of course, no, I mean, but, but, you know, to know, like, we, um, and, you know, I think we have lots I mean, of common ground. And the reality is, I mean, we are in politics and we have to learn how to do this. I mean, I'm at City Hall right now and the people that I probably work the best supported people that were running against me, and I work very well with them and we're doing, I think, very good things together. And, and, you know, I think that the 
what we have to keep in mind is what's the best for the community and how can we move forward the agenda that, that I think the community wants to move forward. Uh, and I think that on key issues, as you can probably see here, we're very much on the same page on a lot of issues. So I think that, um, you know, party politics aside, there has to be a community agenda and these issues that need to be the central focus of what we do. Uh, I will be uh, always, you know, working, like I said, I'm going to be working with this organi organizing this meeting about Mothers for Child Care and, you know, we already talked about that we need to invite our provincial counterpart. I'm doing something that has been done in, in the Portuguese community, Citizenship Drive. I've invited Andrew to come to the Citizenship Drive because he's our local MP now and, and I'm going to be reaching out to, to the local uh, MPs. I mean, it's the will of the community and that's, that's what it is. And I have a quick question. Is there anything that we can do to make your job easier? Like, uh, in order for you to feel that, um, like, so if when you guys are, I don't know what you have to do, you're trying to represent us, but what can we do to make what you're doing easier? Well, sharing information. Yeah, I thought that was a great suggestion about about sending out our, our e newsletters yeah. to your to your networks. I think that's that's that would be great. Probably not screaming at not not screaming at the microphone. Aw, I like screaming. Well, the more that we learn how, the more we understand how these systems work, right? So I mean, you know, we're the ones that are going to be doing the news